Hi, everybody. Welcome to this Texas Posted webinar today. I love this title because we're going to be talking about your nonprofit marketing plan. I know we talk about strategic plan, but we're talking about your marketing plan. And get this, it says workshop. So I think you might have a deal in the work. I don't know, but they're going to let you know in a minute. I always like to have my pencil and paper handy for myself. Let me um, go to the next slide, show you how you can engage today. I know many of you are um, returning webinar attendees, but if you're new, if you have a question, we would love for you to put it in the Q&A. That way we can answer your question at the end. Um, I know a lot of people type in the chat, but please try to use the Q&A. If you need the closed caption, go ahead and type on the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we're going to email these slides and this video to you tomorrow. So look for that in your email. And I wanted to share one other thing before I turn this over to our guests. I don't know if you heard about Quad here at TechSoup. I'm going to put a link in the chat room. But Quad is our uh, exclusive new community that we have here at TechSoup. You're going to get exclusive events, um, expert technical support, um, get to know other nonprofits who are working in your area. And then one of the big things is access to the entire TechSoup course catalog. I don't know if you've taken any courses. Some of them might be $10, $90, but you're going to get access to the entire uh, TechSoup catalog and take as many courses as you can. I'm going to pop a link here in the chat. And I'm going to turn this over to our special guest. Um, we have two members here from TAP Network. Um, Lisa Quigley and Jason Spanger, welcome. And I'll turn this over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Nice to meet you all. I know I was on uh, last week's or two weeks ago webinar, but my name is Jason Spangler. I'm our director of business development here at TAP Network. I work with a lot of nonprofits like your, like each of and from each and every one of you that's joined us today to help them essentially find ways to scale and grow their operation. Uh, Lisa, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Hi, good morning, afternoon, wherever you're calling from. Uh, my name is Lisa Quigley, and I am the Director of Strategy, of Account Strategy here at TEP Network. I have 20 years of experience in marketing and communications, working um, from startups to nonprofits to Fortune 100 and 500 companies um, with their marketing initiatives. So very excited to be here and talk about our marketing plan. So a little bit about TAP Network or a little background on us. We're a full service digital marketing agency that has partnered with TechSoup now for over eight years. Uh, together, we've been able to provide a tremendous amount of marketing thought leadership and really expertise to not only TechSoup themselves, but also to their members uh, or thousands of their members really at this point. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us today and hope that we're able to provide you some actionable insights or some ideas for 2024. Let's jump right in. So today's topic, we're going to be developing a nonprofit marketing plan. Uh, this might sound like a small endeavor to some, but it actually encapsulates a lot of what our agency offers. So before we jump in, I know Lisa and I wanted to throw out a quick poll for the audience. So the poll for today is, what is the state of your current marketing strategy? So your options are no, A, no marketing strategy or marketing campaigns are active, so you're not doing anything. Uh, marketing campaigns are active, but strategy needs improvement. So you need looking for ways to improve what you're doing, maybe you're unsure. Uh, C, the marketing strategy is built, but launching the campaign is a challenge. So maybe you need tooling. Maybe you're not sure of the best ways to start that. Or D, our marketing strategy is solid and the campaigns are working well. You're just looking for some extra tidbits or some marketing hacks out of today. All right. The results are coming in about 67, 69% marketing campaigns are active, but strategy needs some improvement. Awesome. We love that because... We love strategy. All right, we'll give you a, we got um coming in, behind, actually tied at around 15, 16% between um, what is the state and it's built, but it's a little bit of a challenge. So we get that. Awesome, well, everybody, I'm gonna close that out so we can keep on rolling. And I'll share those results. Lisa, I think that that very much reflects a lot of the conversations I have with the members uh, each day is that 
they are trying to do campaigns, but a lot of times it needs improvement or they're looking for ways for to really be more impactful. So let's jump right in. So today, three comp components. And what we're going to talk about today are one, how to create a one-liner. So this, think of it as kind of your North Star for your mission. You know, what do you do? Why should I care? And how do I get involved? Your entire mission encapsulated in one thing. The next piece we're going to speak about is wireframe your website. So ways to create a high converting homepage to ensure that that North Star that you're getting people excited about, they also have a way to re realistically get involved. And then the last piece we'll, we'll uh, roll into is how does how do both of those play out in a full funnel marketing campaign? So to give you ideas of ways to drive things in and also how to capture and then benchmark what you're doing. Are you successful? Are you not successful in certain ways? Um, so we're going to jump into that one-liner. What do you do? And when we develop a one-liner, I think this is so broad. People are like, well, why, why does this matter? I, it matters so much because this is that elevator pitch that you need to have. It is that North Star for your entire organization. And many of the marketing you know, assets that you'll develop fall out of this. You know, many nonprofits struggle with creating and articulating their, their mission digitally. So what can you do? So this is a three-step process. And we like to say, first, you want to identify your target customer and the major problem that you're looking to help them solve. So this is something quick and concise. You want to make sure it's not ambiguous, ambiguities, ambiguous, sorry. <laughs> um, and that it's kind of into a soundbite or something pretty brief because you want them to understand, yes, that's me, something they can kind of latch on to. The second piece you're going to do is articulate your unique solution to that problem. How can you help them? What do you do? How do you get them? And the last piece is, what's the successful end to that story? And I always like to kind of refer back to P90X. Uh, it, I am in my late 30s and was one that did buy into the P90X Phenomena. I think a lot of people probably understand that. And when you looked at that, you were looking to buy it. You bought into P90X, which was the weight loss program, because you wanted to be energetic like Tony Horton. You wanted to have all that energy, feel have the self confidence, and ultimately be ripped. So that was the successful end of the story. But you didn't buy into it because you wanted to work out for an hour and a half each day, or you wanted to eat some crazy fat diet. It was the end result you were after. So that's a lot of what your one liner needs to say is it needs to say that successful end of the story so people know, yes, that is my North Star. That is what I want. That's what, I'm, what, I, what I would love to achieve. And then we can walk back the steps of getting there. Any thoughts here, Lisa, on this? Um, no, that's just exactly right. I think um, in theory, everybody understands what a one-liner is and, and the importance of it. But where we have... The workshop part is, do you really have your one-liner and is everybody in your organization bought in and know what it is? And where do you have that one-liner? Because um, I know in many organizations I've been a part of, we we could say that one-liner variations of, of it several different ways, right? But having that consistency um, and, and really having buy-in is important. I, you know, that's a good point. And also that your one-liner will often change as your group organization grows and you kind of bring in new initiatives, you might find that this starts to pivot and you have to revisit this. So it's not a set at once and it's good to go. It's often something you need to revisit every year or so. Mm -hmm. So some examples of good one-liners. So Habitat for Humanity, uh, what is their problem? They cannot, people can't afford to buy a home through a traditional means. Uh, solution, Habitat for Humanity builds and sells affordable homes to qualified families. Their success is families have a safe and affordable place to live. They're able to build equality or equity and stability for their future. In other words, Habitat for Humanity builds communities. You know, So their one-liner is Habitat for Humanity builds affordable homes for families in need so they can achieve the stability and equity they deserve. In other words, they get a fair shot at life. Instead of having to worry about is there food on the table, if there's a place to sleep at night, they actually can focus on what the rest of us that already have that do. Getting good grades in school, having you know, after school activities, things like that. So I think that's a great example. Uh, we'll jump into the next one. Uh, Parkinson's Association. 
They're empowering people with Parkinson's to live well today and inspire hope for a better tomorrow. Very short, very sweet. I love this because the problem is Parkinson's is a chronic and pro progressive disease. It affects the nervous system. And while they don't have a cure for it today, there are a lot of ways that you can live better and things you can do to progress. So their solution is they provide a variety of resources and support services for people with Parkinson's, their families, and their support, you know, their supporting or supporters so that they can be better educated, you know, raise advocacy and also, you know, drive research. Uh, their success is they're empowering people with Parkinson's to not only live better, but also progress our understanding of the disease. So that's a one-liner as a whole. So how does this play out? The big piece here is the idea behind a one-liner is to generate that North Star as we spoke, but ultimately so that people can go, hey, that's something I can latch on to. That's something that I you know, find near and dear. Or I've had experiences with that. How do I get involved? The goal for that is to get them to your website. So when they get on your website, your website's job is to be that 24-7 mission salesperson. Yes, you are selling. It's a nonprofit. I understand, but you're selling your mission. And so that website needs to provide a clear path for people to not only find out what you do, but then drive them to getting involved. So here's a great example. And this is something for homework for you to go back and look at your existing website. Does it offer the same experience later? is do you have a hero section that has that one line or your call to action clear up front, right at the top as we see up here? You know, does it then provide a value section? What are the values that you provide? So once I already bought into your mission statement, I understand the value. Now I might be interested in, you know, thinking about the problems. Oh yeah, those are the problems I am. So I'm slowly becoming more invested as I scroll through your website. Oh, these are the solutions you offer. You know, it, then some thought leadership, happy clients, you know, examples of that. But the stories, if you share those up front, they don't have that same relevance. People don't latch onto them the same because they're not even sure what you do. If we keep moving through this kind of this setup that we do for a high converting homepage, you'll see then we share the three-step action plan. Again, to the same point, the action plan is irrelevant if I don't even know why I should be interested. Same thing with your impact, your spotlights, options for support, and then ultimately a lead capture form at the bottom, because we want people to reach out. We want them to say, hey, that's me. Raise your hand. Whether you're a donor, a volunteer, or a supporter, or someone simply looking to utilize your services, they each should have an easy way to reach out. So I see here. So some examples of websites we've done. Again, so this is a great way to see kind of this thought process in the in your use case. We designed both juice bar chargers and we have an upcoming website, which we shared a little bit here for Delaware community health workers to give an idea of how we're using this layout to ensure that we can convert at a higher rate. So in this portion, I think we kind of roll into the full funnel marketing strategy, Lisa. Why don't you kind of educate everyone how this plays out within a full funnel marketing strategy and why, you know, the messaging needs to be on point and why their website needs to convert people to ultimately raising their hands saying, hey, I'm interested. Awesome. Well, first we're going to do, um, and if you could actually go back to that other slide, because I would love to do an informal poll on the chat of who knows what a full funnel marketing strategy even is. Have you heard of that term? Do you use it? Uh, drop a heart in the chat if you have, or, or maybe a question mark if you haven't. Um, but either way, don't worry, because we're going to go through it um, and break it down and all of the lingo right now. Um, so I love this. I got question heart, question heart. It's like <laughs> a couple of questions, question marks, a heart. Oh, that's so fun. Okay. So full funnel marketing strategy refers to an approach that guides potential customers or stakeholders through their journey with your organization. Um, this strategy is typically visualized as a funnel because it represents the process of narrowing down a broad audience into a smaller group. And you lead them through awareness. We'll talk about some different strategies and, and tactics when it comes to awareness and then there's consideration. They consider your organization, 
um, they consider your mission, uh, they might look for more resources or get more information during the consideration phase. And then there's conversion. Um, ideally, we'd love them to, to donate, to um, volunteer, whatever it is for your organization. Um, each audience or client or constituent stakeholder will go through this process. Um, it's really important, though, before we just kick off our full funnel marketing campaigns and talk about email and blogs and all and advertising, all the fun stuff, um, we have to lay the foundation for what your plan is, um, because working with really nonprofits, business, you talk about purse, Jason was talking about his personal goals. Um, you have to identify, one, what are your goals? Um Two, who's your audience? And three, omni-channel user journey. Okay, there's another big word. We can drop some other hearts or question marks for omni-channel, and don't worry, I'll get into it. Um, but for SMART goals, SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. I'm going back to the fitness goal. So this may or may not be my own uh, smart goal, but in the next six months, I will improve my fitness by running three times a week and increasing my distance from two miles to five miles so that at the end of the six months, I'm running five miles without stopping. We can all like, okay, that sounds like, you know what you're talking about. You're going to take steps to achieve it. And it's in a, it's in a specific time frame. When we think about that for our business, um, and I'm going to go through a, an example of one of our clients, which is uh, birth to three early intervention, we want to talk about increasing uh, referrals by 25% through email marketing, um, content marketing, outreach, and visits in the next year. So again, we're getting very specific about what our goals are. So that's the first step. Uh, the second step is to I define your ideal audience. No matter, I look, I saw some amazing organizations. Um, most likely everybody has a little bit different of a, an audience. And most times you have two or three different audience types. So we're going to go through examples of breaking down your, what we call your personas. Um, and the last thing is that user omni-channel user journey. And what's, what we mean by omni-channel is that it ensures a seamless integrated user experience across multiple channels, whether it's social media, email, websites, or in-person events. Um, this will not only engage your audience, it'll establish trust and credibility um, and really consistency throughout each channel once you're thinking about what are these tactics. So you may have heard of multi-channel versus omni-channel. Really in today's marketing, and yes, it's changing all the time, but we were we really use um, omni-channel when it talks to when we're working with our nonprofits. And that means that your audience is at the center of all the communications. And it's not, we're going to send this one email one time and that's it. It's really how does the email relate to the social media post relate to when they come to the in-person event? Um, so really, omni-channel is what we're striving for. And there is our beautiful funnel. Um, here's where we like to <laughs> work with our organizations to define what this funnel means for them. Um, just to walk through this graphic a little bit, on the left-hand side, you'll see a portion of the funnel is really to attract. It's to get that, to get your mission, your purpose out there in a way that people are going to stop the scroll. They're going to want to pay attention. And then that's not it. What if they're like, wow, your organization is amazing, but they don't get involved. I mean, that's wonderful. You're building a brand presence, but we really want people to take action. And so the last two steps in the funnel um, will encourage them and nurture them to do that. Uh, you'll see along the right-hand side, uh, the steps of our full funnel process. So 
I said three, we break it down a little bit more and you could do four or five, but awareness, they're aware of your brand through um, paid advertising. You you may run an ad in the local newspaper. Hey, you may do um, a social media blast and, and boost that post. You could, your website is really um, a great way for people to, hey, I sell an ad and I'm going to go and I'm going to check that out. Um, but your website will also move down into the consideration. So while it represents your brand, um, it also will give them information. Um, and that'll be important as, as far as user journeys of where we take um, them on the website. Uh, but say they go to your website and they sign up for your newsletter to learn more information. Um, we're moving them down into consideration and they're utilizing the, the resources that you have. Say you have a white paper, a case study, um, a testimonial. These are, they're digging deeper and they're establishing um, trust with your organization. And then once you have them through through that um, part of the funnel, then you can really activate. Hey, now you can donate. Um, now you can volunteer. So I would love to answer any questions as we get to the bottom on the um, on the funnel. But this is really the the basics and the basis for most nonprofit and um, really any business's marketing plan. So we're going to take a step now into personas. Um, and if you could move that to the next slide, we're going to talk about uh, birth to three, as I mentioned, is one of our clients. And we were going to initiate this full funnel strategy um, for them. And we had to identify who do you want to talk to and what do you want to say? Um, we identified that for and birth to three are is early intervention services to identify children with delays and disabilities. Um, so our primary target audience are parents and caregivers as they are taking care of these children and we need to educate them on our services. Um, and then providers, clinicians, uh, physical therapists, pediatricians. And um, lastly is, you know, the community at whole or our partners. And so we, if you go to that next slide, yeah, we took a deeper dive into, and here I'll just show you one example of the persona of a caregiver. And when we do this, um, and you should go through this exercise too, it may seem a little bit funny, but you identify each target persona and you put yourself in their shoes. What are their motivations? What is their need? What is their, and this doesn't mean that you're just gonna target this one person. It just means it's a snapshot to give you an idea of, what messaging resonates with them? Where are they online? Because someone, um, if we're talking about professionals, you know, you think about LinkedIn, scholarly journals, articles, web pages, um, versus a mom seeking advice from other moms, There, that could be Facebook groups. So at, when we take a deeper dive into these personas, as I encourage you all to do, um, really look at, again, their needs, their motivations and where they are so that we can go into this next um, step of starting to reach out to them. Um, when we start to formulate our plan for how are we gonna reach our target persona, we have to go about, back to our goals. Um, is our goal to just create awareness? Is it to make them, is it to make, um, Encourage them to volunteer, encourage them to donate. Depending on what you're trying, the action you're trying to do will dictate your goals. And then goals are nothing if you can't measure them and you don't keep track of them. So identifying even before we get into um, our strategy and start you know, implementing marketing tactics, we have to know how we're gonna measure it and what our baseline is. The next step, is um, a, a fun exercise. Now that you're in the shoes of your target persona, now that you know what your goals are and how you're gonna measure them, you really should track, how are they finding you? What is their journey from that awareness stage to the promoter loyalist stage? Um, and for 
Cecily here, who's our caregiver, we were going to employ the tactics of paid ads, all of our social channels, of course, our website, um, and print marketing material. So consideration are the tactics and content that we're going to use um, and the messaging that we're going to use on those uh, different tactics. And then we have calls to action, right? So you can have your marketing material and it can be beautiful, but if you don't have that specific call to action that relates back to, to your goals and how you're going to measure it, you may lose them there. They may drop off. Um, so we have a great call to action, but we don't stop there. Then we reach out, um, whether or not it's an email, it's a form, it's a phone call, and we're really um, thinking ahead to how we're going to nurture that relationship. And then in the end, um, we'll be able to measure who went from awareness to a loyalist, an advocate, a promoter. You know, Lisa, this brings up a really good point too. I get a lot of people that have the misconception that if they can get someone from awareness to the decision, that they can then get an instant donation. So if we use don don't someone a donor as an example, great. So they hit my website, it says the right message. So now they can go donate. We find that 99% of these people don't donate that first time. They're interested in learning more, but it's ultimately the result of what you see in the green area of that email blast, slowly sending relevant information for that target audience that ultimately encourages them and gets them to jump in and get truly involved. So that, go ahead. You're right. Those And those barriers too, anticipating um, when you do the personas, what what barriers do they have? What questions do they have? They could be very different and you're not going, FAQs are fine on the website, but you're not going to address every concern or barrier. So nurturing that, like you said, through um, a process of emails or communication, you know, is really the, the key to getting them to the next step. So we can jump in. I, I know now we're going to, now that we've kind of give you the background of what we're after, how we deploy these marketing strategies. So there's a couple of different ways to get started. You can do it from the manual way, which is what a lot of people reach out to talk to us with. Hey, I'm currently doing a lot of this in Excel or with Google Docs, Sheets, Airtable, all different ways of tracking all this and measuring it. But this is largely done by hand. And while it's supportable as you're a small nonprofit, as you grow and you bring in different target audiences and you start to vary your messaging uh, and make it specific to each different constituent type, it quickly can grow out of control. And next thing you know, you find yourself just focusing on one type or the other, or you know, it's giving month. So now we're looking, oh, it's only focusing on donors, but come January, now we're going to switch and go back to volunteers. It, it's really, if you have a consistent marketing plan for all of these different audiences, you'll find that you grow much faster. And so that typically involves bringing on a system like a CRM. So if you're not familiar with what a CRM is, that is a constituent management system. And in this, it, it is something where you can measure your progress. You can measure your failures. You can measure your successes. And it also allows you to effectively deploy an omni-channel marketing strategy like Lisa spoke about. Um, you know, proper messaging to, to your proper audience. It allows donors to get that, not getting a volunteer message because they're not interested in volunteering. They just want to write a check. And vice versa, people that are volunteering, they don't, they, they might not be interested in donating, donating at all. They have time, not money. Uh, so the, providing you the ability to really track your success of your marketing efforts, uh, automate a lot of these manual processes so you don't need to bring on more employees. It can be done you know, automatically. It also, it'll allow you to ensure that your content's a lot more consistent and provide you the ability to not only segment your audiences, but then reach out to them with tailored messaging. So there's a lot of advantages here uh, with bringing in one. Now there's multiple ways to get started here. A lot of people will start, take that little nibble and they'll start with like a MailChimp or a constant contact. Great way to start blasting out those email newsletters. But ultimately it still doesn't provide you that nuanced and detail that you need to start segmenting all this data. And so we are a Platinum HubSpot partner here at TAP. So we use uh, HubSpot ourselves and love it as a product. So if that's something where you, you've done the constant contact, you've done the MailChimp and it's no longer meeting your needs, 
we would love to help and have those discussions to see if does HubSpot make sense for your organization. And for some, yes, and others, it doesn't. Um, so some examples of what it can do. So contact management, lead management, you can manage emails and document sharing. You can create those call to action forms that we that Lisa was speaking about so that we can start tracking who's getting involved. Do you want, when someone reaches out for one of those call to action forms, do you want them to automatically get those emails? Do you, we can set those up as a campaign. So yes, they reached out about volunteering. Here's the six month email list we're gonna send them about ways they can get started and volunteering options. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to have someone, to, yes, you have someone manage it at a high level, but you don't have to worry about if they come in on a Wednesday and you've been out that they don't get answered until Monday when they're no longer thinking about it. So all this leads into obviously budget. And I think this is a big one that we often talk about, Lisa. And it, what I'm interested in knowing, what do people budget for marketing? I know it's kind of taboo. What, what is marketing? What should we have? I mean, your average nonprofit puts aside anywhere from five to 15% from uh, marketing. And I would say that amount, while it's hard to throw a hard percentage at it, it your results are very indicative of what you're spending. And so the, the more you're willing to invest in yourselves, typically the better the results, as long as it's put in the right place. Did you want to add anything here, Lisa? Yeah. And I also think it depends on where your organization is. Are you just starting out and you're looking to grow? You know, then you do need to actually invest more um, in your marketing to get the word out. Are you an organization that just wants to maintain and not saying that in a bad way, but then perhaps you just keep it around that nine or 10%. Um, there's not a one size fits all. And, and again, just like our one liners may change, um, the, the budget may change year to year, but we thought it's a, a good idea just to give a ballpark of how much money um, you should be spending, you know, compared to your um, when you're looking at your P&L statement um, or just compared to your revenue and different places. I mean, we have it here, um, but that most businesses put their marketing budget, you know, is into digital marketing, um, their website and development, right? That is printing and having a brochure, especially depending on what industry you, you're in is great, but your website is your brochure. It's everybody is looking at that to get information. Um, of course, if advertising is right, that should take a portion of it. Um, but those tool, the tools as well, you know, we were talking about a CRM and um, constant contact. And there's so many, we did another webinar on AI. There's so many tools and software that technology is increasing and changing every day. But especially as a nonprofit, you could use these tools to save on resources. Investing in the tool may help you save later. So budget exactly. I think need, yeah, needs to be talked about when we talk about our, our marketing plan. Exactly. And I'm, so as a whole, we end up dealing, helping people build websites a lot of times. We don't want to be the first one to, we don't want to design your first website, but when you've taken a good hard approach yourself and you're ready to really step up what you're doing, we end up engaging with a lot of nonprofits first with their website because you can knock on doors to create traction there, but your, your ED can only answer so many phone calls. And if they're focused purely on telling people what you do and why they should care and how they get involved, they don't have time to look for those big partners. They don't have time to find search for those big grants that are going to really take your organization to the next level. So we find by having that proper messaging and a properly built website up front, it really ends up being kind of that uh, transition point that allows you to expand in other areas. So I want to jump into the next poll. So what is your biggest challenge with working with your contacts? Generating new contracts and building lists? I mean, so are you looking to find, you know, new people to reach out to and find, you know, building lists of people to, you know, target? B, keeping clean lists active and segmented. So clean data, people that are actually interested in what you do. Uh, do you have old stuff that is no longer relevant? And so you get a lot of bad feedback. Uh, C, maintaining communication and increasing engagement. So is it just maintaining it? You're not, you don't have a consistent outreach cadence um, and ways to measure what you're doing. Or D, reporting on how your contacts are interacting with your organization. 
again, measuring, right? What's good, what's bad, what's working, what's not. Uh, big portion of getting, you know, growing your organization is being able to measure what does work and what doesn't. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so we were quite a, around 50-50 between generating new contracts. Oh, yep, I'm sure. Contacts, by the way, I'm reading that as, yeah. <laughs> um, and building lists and maintaining communication and increasing in, engagement. Um, and as we were speaking to before, several different software um, and tools out there that help make it easy. Now we've worked with nonprofits and we use Excel and uh, paper sheets, right? And, um, and different listservs, but really organizing these lists, especially by your target audience and persona and personas will give you that advantage of streamlining your communications. And I, I think that that answers the last one really well, Lisa. And the first one, I know a lot of that sometimes can be done by generating those personas that Lisa spoke about earlier is, do you know who you're speaking to? Do you know the message that you should be sending or what they ask consistently? And that can help you build out those lists, but you have to define that target audience as an entity so that you can better match your messaging that's going to them. Exactly. Um, and we have, I think, some great questions when we get to that, um, that actually lead into exactly what you're saying about uh, how does our, how do our goals, especially um, goals with that executives or maybe the other team are trying to accomplish, uh, line up with what you actually are doing as far as your marketing efforts, because sometimes they're not all always aligned. Um, we had someone say that their executive leadership just wanted to create an app. Um, but is your, are your target audiences, is that where they are? Does that help you increase your goals? So we'll get into that um, in, a, in a little bit. And that the app is a great thing to bring up, Lisa, just because I have a lot of past experience there. Um, a, you know, app adoption rates in themselves, forget if it's an amazing app, but the adoption rate itself is actually hard. People are hard pressed anymore to download something new. So unless you are providing an outstanding value with that app, you are going to be up against really hard adoption rates purely for downloading regardless. So you are limiting your exposure. So that's why a lot of people end up focusing on their website to offer a lot of that material because everyone has a browser. Everyone can get to your website. It doesn't require them to take two extra steps, three extra steps, just to see what you're sharing. Yep. And I would say, you know, you take them through that process of um, who is the app for, you know, what will be on that app? What is the messaging versus a website? And then looking at also your budget, like the budget, how much of that would be um, directly related to the creation of that versus opportunity costs of what else you could do um, with the end goal. Yeah. Well, I'm well done. I'm going to jump into kind of how you how we can help you. So again, just like last time, these are there's multiple ways that you can get involved with our team, and we do offer multiple solutions. Uh, this slide deck will be shared with you afterwards. So if you click on the learn more, it will take you right to our marketing page where you can see some of our options and inquire for more discussions with our team. So let's jump right into the Q and A. Awesome. And maybe we'll just start from um, the top down, even though it's uh, the first question is from Britt. And this is to you, Jason. Um, although I have some opinions, I can chime in. How does a nonprofit's one liner different from a mission or a vision statement? So, you know, I, I feel a one liner is something that if you're on an elevator, you can say very quickly and effectively. It's something that's easy to understand. And it's something that's easy to get involved with. Uh, I think mission statements often are very long and very thought out. And they can include uh, verbiage that is specific to what you do. For example, like today's call, we talked about full funnel marketing. Most of you didn't know what it was. Uh, we talked about omni-channel marketing. Again, it was like a lot of question marks. So keep it easy and approachable, clean and concise. 
I think that is the biggest difference. And it also gives you something that your team can use as an overarching North Star. I mean, that I can't say that enough because then everyone in your organization knows they're marching towards the same point, the same end game. Yep, that's awesome. And just to provide um, an example, when you think of, since we're all professionals on LinkedIn, um, you know, LinkedIn clearly articulates that they um, are a relation, a software platform to connect professionals, and it's going to be this lengthy statement that got guides not only internal team members, but external stakeholders, whereas it could be their one liner is relationships matter. Like relationships matter. Um, so having both of those are very important, but hopefully that, um, yeah, answered. And I saw Piper threw in the chat that is this similar to Nike's just do it. I would say it's more than that just because just do it that they have so much brand recognition that they can get away with that. Um, in this case, most people don't know what you do. So you have to establish your relevance. Think of it this way. At the end of the day, your nonprofit organization is still vying for that same non-discretionary income that for-profit companies are. So you have a big hurdle to jump where you have to establish what is that value you're providing? What is that end result? And you have to tell an empathetic story that really aligns with your target audience so that they know why they should be getting involved. It speaks to them internally. Yeah, I think you're right. Like Nike's just do it. Everybody could adopt that as their one-liners, but because they're so well known, you know what they're referring to when they say just do it. Um, so it is, you know, their one liner, but for for nonprofits, for companies like our size, you know, you have to try and um, use simple and concise words that, like Jason said, describe what you do. So in the example of LinkedIn, like relationships matter. OK, we understand that whatever you're doing is revolving around connection and relationships. But that was that was great. You want to take the next one? Let's see here. What do we have? Sure. Um, there is we, the next question from Zen was about organizing sections on a website. And I don't know if we had that 10 step. Let me go back. So we have a process. Um, and Jason, if you went back to slide 14, and we call it our um, 10 step process for a highly converting homepage. Right. Um, and it wraps your marketing all into one. Um, and I'll briefly go into it, but Jason, if you have anything to add. So really when you, you wanna think about your personas and each user um, when you're developing content for your home for your homepage, um, we go into a hero section. This is again, just like your one liner, something visual that will grab um, the audience and want them to uh, learn more. And when they're scrolling down, this is the it, psychology, the order that they're going to be thinking, okay, well, I'm intrigued, but what do you offer? So then there's your value stack. Okay. I see that you offer that, but I have a problem. You've identified the problem next, but not only are you just calling out the problem, you're next, you want to talk about the solution. And so now that they've bought in that you understand them and they understand you, you talk about your credibility. It's the thought leadership. So how many community members, how many lunches have you served? How many, you know, we're talking about um, quick numbers uh, that establish credibility. And going into the next five steps, um, we have, what would you like them to do? This is where it might be volunteer, donate, get involved with the board. Um, you're going to have that next. And again, you'll be getting these, but um, really it is a highly, con our strategy for converting homepages. Um, you could then have what is your impact, perhaps testimonials or your service option. And then really at the end, you know, you want to close them learn more, get their information. So then you can continue to nurture that relationship. Anything else to add, Jason? No, I think you, you really went over it really well. <laughs> and, and maybe the only thing to add is not every nonprofit needs every one of these steps. 
So there is, yes, this is, while we have kind of a formula for what we do, it, not all these are always needed. So it is still on a case by case scenario. I, um, yep, I'm gonna just jump into the next one from David. And it sort of relates back to the website a little bit, but um, he asked, do you have any advice on how to speak specifically to one audience effectively without, without ostracizing another on the same platform? Um, so just as we had that hero section and we were going through the website to self-identify and call out who you're talking to. Um, you know, right from the get-go is very important. And that could even be an email, a social post, your website. You want to identify who you're talking to and then make sure that that message resonates, is in the language that's appropriate and on appropriate level, and you're communicating um, as simply and as effectively as possible to them. Um, so that may lead them to a different page on your website or you know, have a brochure for your different audience, but making sure one, you're identifying and they're able to identify um, on the materials who you're talking to and then really hone in those messages. I think that's a great answer. No, it, it's it's interesting as, as each organization gets more and more complex, that's where sometimes if you have multiple audiences and you have a big disparity between them, it can make sense to bring in someone that's a professional at this, some UI, UX engineer or stuff like that, where they can really understand who we're speaking to and then make recommendations to ensure that no one is alienated. Yep, absolutely. Let's see here. I know we have lots of um, questions. You want to go ahead, Jason, take one? Yeah. So, Kara, you're saying nonprofits that rely on grants and government funding typically have little control over the funding received for marketing. It's sporadic and not generally a priority for funders. That is correct. Uh, I think the on the government end, it is a lot harder because you're relying on things that are happen more on an annual basis and the government's used to paying one time. I, so... If that's who you're speaking to, sometimes those websites end up being a lot more focused towards the people that they're uh, designed for, the actual users that are going to take advantage of that. And then sometimes you can create different marketing material specific to those funders, the government entities to ensure that you're checking those boxes. Um, I know Lisa does have more more experience on the government end. I have done more on the for-profit side. Uh, any other ideas there, Lisa? Well... I mean, I mean, it is a fact that for um, government or, or nonprofits, you have to apply for grants. Um, there's a there's a couple of strategies or tactics that, depending on your organization, one may work for for you. But um, having when you're applying for these grants for marketing, um, having a strategy in place will ensure that potentially um, you get that grant. Uh, versus saying we're going to create awareness by um, handing out how handing out one pagers about our organization versus this is our goal. This is our audience. This is how we're going to reach them. This is our measurement. This is how we plan to measure. Um, and you can all and you can do that, you know, many tactics, but taking the digital media route where we actually can measure these things, you know, Again, it's not answering your question of you don't have a, a lot of control um, in where that funding comes from, but potentially by upping your game with the strategy, you will receive more of those um, more of those grants. And then the other thing with a smaller budget, you know, you're not relying on um, revenue in necessarily to, to dictate it. It's how can you how can you be scrappy with that budget? How can you utilize it um, and coming up with a plan to say, we're going to use our resources in the best way possible to reach our audience? Um, and there are ways to do that. That's that's true. And being able to go back, so if it's the same grantor that's uh, providing funding each year, having the ability to go back and show them your progress and show you your increase, I, I think would allow you to, to in turn request more. If you mm -hmm. can show that you are making consistent, you know, impact. Absolutely. Um, all right. So Deb says, I 
just joined a nonprofit board where the founder created a website a few years ago, and they're ready to move to a new platform. Um, but they're just no way they'd sign up for doing all of that work. Uh, can you advise what the crucial 20 or 30 percent of what you present would be? So I think what Deb is saying, Jason, and you probably get these conversations and questions all the time. It's like, yes, everything that you're saying is wonderful, but you know, we're not going to be able to implement um, everything all at once. So for you, what what is your answer to them and and how would you well, start? A lot of my answers to this, it, it really depends. I would love to tell you there's an answer for everyone, but everyone, every nonprofit I speak to is typically in a little different point of the journey. And so a, a lot of it is high, understanding their go-to-market strategy, what's worked, what hasn't, and really helping them identify the biggest bang for the buck. And I hate saying that, but it's true of where can we be successful and where can we measure our success so that we can not only implement it, one, it's a it's something they can realistically use, but they can also use it to measure and turn around and ask for more money or prove that this is a working strategy and create a bigger budget for the next uh, project in turn. And then we can slowly scale and grow what your impact is. Yep, absolutely. And I think now I'm sounding like um the the squeaky wheel or repeating myself, but I think if you can go to them with this plan and you can identify um, you know, the the strategies and then prioritize the strategies. It's you do 20%, but you do a little bit at, at a time. You know that your target audience spends 90% on on the web and that's how they get their information. Well perhaps instead of going right into advertising, social media advertising, you invest into your web in your website. Um, and the reverse could be true, but it's really knowing your audience and where they are and then picking and choosing those tactics to invest um, the 20%. And, and hey, no, there's nothing wrong with a five-year plan, you know, and you just grow and you build on that um, each year. I see Alicia was asking, more demand with a successful MKT campaign requires more capacity to serve a bigger audience. Yes, you're correct. How do you find the right balance in the growth process? Great question. And it really comes down to the individual hurdles you're trying to solve, Alicia. Um, based on where you're kind of falling short, we like to look at the full funnel, now that we've spoken about it, to kind of identify the pitfalls of the user journey and where people are falling off. And once we can do that, we can make better recommendations, whether it's, yes, we should spend it on messaging on your website. Uh, should it be in the, the top of the funnel of just driving people in to find out what you do in awareness? Or is it, no, you're getting people from awareness, they're seeing your website, they're converting and clicking on your call to action, but now you don't have consistent outreach uh, keeping them in the loop with what you're doing. So maybe that is instituting a better, like a CRM system or something that can automate that process. Um, a lot of that, I hate to sound like a broken record and say it depends, but it really does. And that's where a lot of this, while you can implement a lot of it yourself, having the ability to measure this process and where people are either having a great, you know, involvement or falling off is the key to success because that allows us to then not waste money. Because if we spend all of our money and awareness and driving people to the website, but the website can't do its job, uh, it, it's the same end result, except for you spent more and got less. Mm -hmm. We're going to try, they're all great questions. Get through these um, quickly. So there's one, can I legally send emails to everybody in my contact list? So the one question is, how did you obtain those emails? Because that, you know, is, is the basis. Did they agree to be um, emailed? Do they know you? Is there a relationship? Um, so I can share in the chat a more detailed answer, but the question is, or, or the answer is, how, how did you get these emails? Do they know? And then making sure that you have um, a couple of things like an opt-out. Um, and you can also send an email to have everyone opt in. Um, but it is good practice to 
ha have a healthy list, meaning that if there's emails that you haven't contacted people in 10 years, it's always good to send them an email, say, hey, are you still send one email? Are you interested in hearing from us? Um, and then they can opt in. Uh, but there are um, different rules based on where you are in the world um, and different acts. And so I'm happy to share that with you. But that was just a quick um, a quick answer. And I, I see along on, alongside our Q&A, also the chat going, I see Deb talking about uh, time. I think time is a huge factor for a lot of nonprofits. You either have money or time. And it's, it never seems to be both at the same time, at least. And so a lot of the free resources, similar to like Google ads, stuff like that, can be a huge time suck, especially if you're a one man ED or one woman ED. I, your mileage may vary. And I say that because it, while it might may be a free resource, it might not be a great time investment because your return might be very slim. Uh, it really depends on the individual tool. So be wary of some of the free tools. I agree. It's more looking at the entirety of your marketing plan and ensuring that you don't have any big glaring issues where you have, you know, users falling off. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading all of the great questions and wishing that I could, <laughs> we could answer them all. Um should nonprofits rely more on email and digital marketing to maintain engagement while increasing their presence online or use a mixture of different types? And this goes right into that omni-channel portion of your marketing approach. So again, omni-channel means that your target audience is at the center and that your marketing techniques will be focused on them, but consistent, and you're using a variety. So you're talking about a variety, but you're trying to say which one, which one is more important. And I think, again, it depends on that audience. Um, do they respond to email better? Do they respond to social? So where are you going to put your efforts and can you do more than one? Just making sure that they're consistent. So, um, I just know that for digital marketing versus a traditional maybe billboard or print ad is all is always better because you can measure it. I wouldn't say I said I shouldn't say always better. Is sometimes um maybe you want to prioritize that because there are measurements that you can have and then um take to enhance your marketing efforts. Um and Julie says, for a startup nonprofit with a small budget, what would you say are the most important tools for or marketing services to invest in early? Um, my Mine is a good brand. Have your brand, have that messaging. Go through the exercise we talked about with one-liners and target audience. Um, but then also, once you have that established, it's your website. I think that's the very first step to not only organize and get everybody bought in from your team, but also it just communicates what you're trying to do. And if you follow the steps of um, not only the 10 step process for the website as it relates to you, um, but also the messaging, you're going to find that you could simply use that one tool, refer everyone there. Um, and that can be um, a really big support to what you're doing on a regular basis. Anything to add to that, Jason? you summed it up pretty well okay trying to look we awesome have we have minutes. i know we we have right. two more minutes three quick ones that are easier to answer so um here's here's a quick one on the way out we have two minutes will you provide your information and the program you have available for TechSoup members so if you want to go back to that slide jason and talk a little bit again about um, sure. there will be a link. Yep. Go ahead. So we do offer multiple services for TechSoup members. If you, when we provide this, the learn more here link will take you to a page that, that, uh, really goes over our marketing services, given this was a marketing centric, uh, webinar. 
Uh, we, if you go under TechSoup services, though, anything under website or web help or marketing is, in fact, TAP Network. So it is our company. So we can help get help or provide help in multiple areas. Um, and it, it really depends on what you're looking for. I know we've kind of touched on websites a lot here today. Uh, no surprise for me, just because that's where a lot of people either have messaging issues or need help. We do offer inquiries where you can reach out to me and we can discuss our web services. Uh, those typically start right around $15,000 to give people an idea. Uh, we Again, we don't want to be your first website. There's a lot of good options to get started on your own. I know the Wix deal is fantastic through TechSoup, $61 for two years for their business level. So if you're looking to get started and create your first website, that would be my first recommendation uh, just because it's super inexpensive and we gave you kind of a template to kind of build. Is it the perfect end result? No, it, but it will get you started and give you a platform to share and create awareness. Um, and then once you're ready, once you've kind of grown and scaled, and a lot of the people that come to me then end up saying, hey, we brought on all these new thoughts, all these new silos of information, and now everything's all over my website. The user experience is terrible. I, they don't know how to get to this or why this is relevant. That's when it's a, typically a great time to bring us in because we can help you organize that content to ensure a seamless user experience and help you kind of get back to growth so that you don't experience mission stag stagnation. Um, I think that's a lot of what ends up happening is you have this critical mass and you grow and then you have so many things going on that you kind of lose sight. Your messaging gets diluted and we love to help people kind of regain that North Star again and to ensure that their digital experience is wonderful. Um, so yes, websites, marketing, we do have monthly retainers as well there. So if you just need someone to be an, an ex, let's say an extra man on the team or woman on the team to help you in a certain area, we do also have monthly retainers as well to help facilitate that. Still cheaper than hiring someone, but it's a, on a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, that's awesome. really it for me. I appreciate everyone's time today and excited to meet you here. I will see you guys again next month. All right. Thanks, Jason.